Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for turning up and, and welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the, uh, the last speaker, Mr. Pascal, said that if you come and visit us, there's prizes. Um, unfortunately, the prize has already been awarded. So if you're here for the prizes, I'm sorry to let you down. Um, and the room being so full, I all assume you've heard of my colleague, Mr. Matthew Yongles, who is the CTO of Smart Logic, and he, are, he and I will be sharing a presentation. Unfortunately, because it's been recorded, we're going to have to do a bit of handing over the microphones. Uh, there, is, there will be some time at the end for questions. Um, if you've got anything burning you want to raise on the way, then please shout, and we will try and address it. Um, so a few questions, if I may. How many of you are existing Mark Logic users? There's a few. Any existing Smart Logic users? Excellent. I know more than all of you, so that's a, a good place uh, to start. So Smart Logic is a platform uh, we call Content Intelligence, and the prime role of that uh, in most organizations that use it is to uncover, unlock the value of information or yeah, the value of information which is locked away in unstructured content. We'll get into a bit more of that, and Matthew will explain some of the technology. Uh, I'm Paul Gunstone. I look after the commercial interests of Smart Logic outside of the US and Americas. So, if I can find the technology. Um, the first thing is, uh, why, do, why do people use us? Well, there's a range of problems on here, and they're roughly divided into sort of businessy and technically. And I'm going to talk about the businessy ones, and Matthew is going to talk about the technically ones. Um, and we've seen some of these expressed already uh, in, in the, on the main stage. A uh, gentleman from KPMG was talking about uh, the KYC, AML, FATCA, all of those sort of com uh, meeting those regulatory compliance. Uh, and we have the first two of those there, where the manual operation of doing that can't cope with the volumes and isn't sufficiently accurate uh, in the pharmaceutical world. Um, pharmacovigilance is an incredibly uh, expensive process to, to fulfill. Uh, we're a MarkLogic partner. There's a few other MarkLogic partners here. Sharing information is quite difficult because you don't use the same language, the same linguistics. We don't talk about things the same way. Uh, I talk about petrol. My colleagues in the US talk about gasoline. We're talking about the same thing. So if you want to share information with partners, you somehow have to normalize all of those linguistic changes. Uh, we saw in the last session about redaction. So how do we know that that document has got some individually identifiable information in it, or personally identifiable or health information in it, if we haven't read the document? That's, that's the challenge. Uh, one of our longest serving um, use cases is discoverability. I can't find stuff. And that's because the metadata that's associated with most content is insufficient. And, and just as an example, if someone was writing this document and storing it away into a document storage somewhere, they would apply some metadata to that. They would give it a title. They'd put their name as the author. They'd give it a date. And it may be some little description. It's the agenda for Mark Logic World. 2016 in London. But actually, there's quite a lot of stuff in here which that small amount of metadata doesn't cover. So what Smart Logic is doing is making that stuff findable. So if you want to know everything you could find out about Paul Gunstone, well, in here there's a picture and a few words about him. That wouldn't be covered by the metadata that's normally associated with it. Um, because of that challenge, organizations are making information Business intelligence, knowledge management, information, missing most of what they already know. How can I say that? Because organizations um, commission engineers' reports. They have meeting minutes, board meetings. They have email. They have, you know, there's a ton of stuff in which a huge amount of wisdom goes, and it's put away into a document management system or a file share or an email or, or even you know, a, a PDF. We heard about, a lot about those yesterday. Uh, and it's not accessible. Not unless someone goes to read it. So, Matthew. So, so far in the conference, we've heard a lot about data silos. And MarkLogic is great for you know, putting all those data silos into a unified database, allowing you to query it, do analytics, reporting, all sorts of things on top of it. But in order to join up that data, you need to align your vocabularies. You need to align your metadata. And how do you do that? You know, when you take on a project, 
of merging those silos, of creating a unified view of those silos. From a technical perspective, you're faced with a challenge of not only understanding where the data come from and what is the meaning of the different elements uh, of data, but also the constituents of it. And we've heard some of it this morning when Joe was talking about the entity service. But what about you know, the ontological aspects of those vocabulary, you know, the equivalencies in the vocabularies, the relationships, etc.? How do you figure those out? It's not only a technical job, but it's also a data science job, and we're going to uh, go through some of that as well. But you know, those data silos and bridging those is very interesting to use you know, the information that's locked away inside of the organization. But what about external data? when you're dealing with regulatory data or public data that you want to add to the mix to contextualize the information you're presenting to your users. And that's where linked open data and linked open vo vocabularies come into play as well. Yet another challenge for aligning vocabularies, aligning terminology. And if you miss those steps and simply try to assemble together all of the data you have in the form that you found it in, all you're going to end up with is a cesspool, a, a data lake that's essentially just a swamp of data that you can't really exploit. So the presentation today is very much about how could you make all that data that you can find, that you can collect, that you can aggregate, self-describing, so you can join it up to perform the analytics, to perform the 360 degree view of your customers and of your information. Thanks, Monsieur. Uh, and the next slide illustrates uh, some of the folks that we are working with who have solved these problems using smart logic. And there's a couple of things uh, I'd want to comment on this slide. One of the reasons for showing it is the enterprise scale. These are all, as you can see, fairly large organizations, many of them global organizations. Um, and we heard yesterday from Gary that uh, one of the key features of smart logic is its enterpriseness. And that's the same for us. So the ability to scale, the ability to be secure. There's a couple of things down here, the US Department of Defense. Uh, uh, the, the US Army, these are uh, uh, these people uh, take security fairly seriously. So um, we are enterprise scale. Again, I've sort of broken this down into uh, roughly financial services, roughly manufacturing, roughly media and retail, uh, life sciences specifically, um, services, I couldn't quite determine how to address those, and, uh, and uh, government-type organisations. Someone has redacted the NHS. Um, but the National Institute of Clinical Excellence allow us to talk about them, but they're part of the NHS and we can't talk about the NHS. So, um, so th that is, th th there's, there's people doing it today, big scale, globally. This is a complicated slide. <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably skip over most of it because you can read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is Semaphore? Semaphore is composed of three uh, core components. And I've already talked about ontologies. So the number one element you know, where you start is in building ontologies. So Semaphore provides an ontology management uh, component very much geared at usability and simplicity. You know, it's geared for subject matter expert for business analysts. You don't need a PhD in semantics to use it, and that's the, the entire point of it. Uh, you can you know, understand, so long as you understand your business data, so long as you can understand and represent your knowledge, you can use the tool, describe your knowledge, and the other parts of Semaphore will then you know, be put to, well, put that knowledge to use. The second component is what we call Semaf Semaphore Semantic Enhancement Server. It's all about user experience. So trying to analyze the user intent against that ontology so we can use that to drive queries uh, and so on. But the point of this slide is very much to focus on the third component, classification, uh, classification server. And that's you know, very much part of the, of the magic of Semaphore because that's where metadata essentially is generated, is created. And it can be done in three ways. And the first functional use case here is enrichment. A lot of time we find semi-structured or unstructured data containing a wealth of information. It can be anything from topics, concepts, themes, uh, primary or secondary themes, anything that describe the content itself, anything that can be used to monetize the content. I mean, at CNN, for example, you know, the point of the project there is to try and maximize user time on the site because users 
come in via Google, read an article, go away. What they want to do is monetize users, get them to read more of their content. And in order to do that, they classify the content so they can provide related content that's very you know, linked to the theme and the intent of the user. So enrichment is very much about thema thematic and subjective uh, metadata generation. The second functional uh, capability is extraction. And that's something we talked about uh, a fair amount yesterday, especially in Michael Hendry's presentation, uh, where for compliance type processes, uh, for operational type processes, you need very high precision, accurate metadata that represents the percentage shareholding of a given shareholders, um, the date at which um, a particular process needs to be renewed, etc. So very highly um, accurate and structured metadata that need to be identified within the content. And it can be sometimes very much obfuscated. It could be a, a driven over a, a number of paragraphs. Uh, it can be found in a table. So some of it um, can be challenging in terms of subject matter expertise. Um, you know, it's, n it's not simply a matter of finding the right word on the right page. It's knowing that this document will be you know, opted out of client money protection. If in the first paragraph we've got this sort of vocabulary, if we've got an amendment uh, that talks about you know, this sort of protections or lack thereof, etc. So it can be very complex clauses in some cases. And the final functional use case is harmonization. And that's very much where the data silo um, conversation comes in again. When you've got semi structured or structured data, is there a need upfront? to harmonize that metadata when you ingest. Well, sometimes there is, but there's definitely also need to harmonize that on the query side. So a bit of both there, um, and we're probably going to cover both use cases um, sometimes, I mean, especially in workflow um, and case management, you tend to normalize a front in the ingestion process. Uh, in the case of monetization, you might be doing it uh, later on in the process when you query so that you can harmonize based on the user intent, based on well, the user target audience, really. So Matthew used the O word there, the ontology word. I, I steer away from the ontology word. Does, who knows what an ontology is? Oh, wow. I'm, I'm impressed. I bow down. Um, I've mentioned that to some business people, and they immediately turn and start doing email. So I, I, I shy away from it. For those of you who don't, for me... Who, and I'm a fairly simple person, it puts the context around understanding. So if I talk about Apple, I might be talking about one of three things. I might be talking about a piece of fruit, a technology company, or the daughter of Gwyneth Paltrow. And unless I understand the context, I don't know what that reference to Apple means. And for us, that domain model, that ontology, sets the context so that when the classification server, that component, reads the text, it understands by reference to the model whether this document is about Hollywood glitz, fruit and vegetables, or technology. And just before I go on, I've got some metaphors here uh, for metadata. So, so this thing here uh, is jelly beans, sweets, bonbons, I don't know what you call them. And it's got some metadata on the back, which is absolutely useless because it's all about hydroglycerides and all that sort of stuff. I don't know what it is. So you taste these at your peril. You have no idea what's in it. These, however, are self-describing. I can look at the colours and I can say, probably lemon, probably cherry, probably strawberry or raspberry. And I can look at the pictures and lo and behold. So that's what metadata does. It helps you go from, I haven't got a clue what I'm about to eat, but it's a sweet, so I'll probably like it anyway, to I can't stand lemon, so I won't eat that. Uh, and I mention that because we've got buckets of these upstairs. So please come along, take them home for the children, and you can use the metaphor of metadata. Okay. Um, very austere body gartner. I say that because they paid my mortgage for 13 years. I worked there for 13 years. Um, what are gartner saying about this world? Well, in 2011, they were saying metadata is really important. You know, if information is a key asset to your organization, you can only understand whether you've got that information and what it is if it's got metadata describing it. So they said that five years ago. Uh, they're saying uh, in two years' time, 80% of data lakes will not include effective metadata. 
Wow, people don't listen to Gartner. I know that from personal experience. Um, but by 2020, 50% of information government initiatives will, do, will rely on the metadata that's not there two years before. So if this is true, organisations have got an awful lot of work to do between 2018 and 2020. So now's the time to get out of information management or IT or whatever it is um, you're in. Oh, but there is a problem. Metadata is not self-generating. It has to come from somewhere. I love this. It does not grow under cabbage leaves. There is no metadata fairy. Um, and we are, we are most definitely not it. So some exists out there. As you can see here, you've got database columns, uh, rudimentary. Uh, people enter it when they're creating a document. But for those of you who work in organizations where content is authored and saved into document management system, content management system, or SharePoint, or whatever else, how many people have tried to get users to enter 50 bits of metadata about a document? 20? 10? Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're reaching the point where there's an expectation you might get. But if you put too much requirement of the user to enter metadata, they don't do it. They find a workaround. And so what what exists is generally very poor. Um, we're going to now look at uh, four uh, use cases from a couple of in different industries, and I'm going to hand over to Matthew to do the first couple. So, in the financial industry, I think the key denominator to all of the projects we've done is the requirement for very accurate facts. So. I've got a couple of slides, I think, from Michael Henry. I'm, I'm sure many of you listened to him yesterday. He was very passionate, actually, about his topic. Fantastic presentation. But everything that you saw on the right-hand side, you know, all the extraction from the documents, that was semaphore. And everything that you saw on the left, pre-population of the fields, that was, again, semaphore. And the idea there is exactly like Paul was saying. If you force users to generate that metadata, to enter, to key in that metadata, you end up in a situation where the metadata is poor. Um, data, well, <coughs> data quality is very variable throughout the course of the day between operators. It might be very accurate on a Monday morning, not so much on Friday at 4 p.m. And there's also the language barrier uh, between the operators. It can be offshore and data uh, producers that may be coming from different uh, you know, area, geographic areas with different legislation. So in that context, what we're doing with Semaphore is making sure that the subject matter experts are able to define what they're looking for, how they should be looking for it. And that metadata, all those facts are extracted in an accurate and repeatable way. So that you don't have that uh, you know, disparity between operators. And the operators, instead of doing the stare, compare, key in, um, that uh, Michael was uh, saying was driving them to <laughs> you know, depression, pretty much, or at least um, getting them to resign very quickly. Uh, instead, they're becoming controllers of the data. They're auditing whatever can be done entirely automatically goes through with maybe a 20% audit just for validation and cross-checking. Uh, the rest um, is going through an exception management and the operators become the creator of the data rather than the creator of the data. Sometimes we do that uh, during the ingestion process, like at KPMG, like um, in mortgage application processing, for instance. Uh, Sometimes we do that on historical data. I mean, we've got a, a really interesting story on, on risk analysis. Um, when the Greek crisis unfolded, one of our clients called up and said, I want to know how many of my Easter master agreements are backed by collateral domiciled in Greece? A very simple question when you think about it, except that doesn't exist in structured data. I mean, the may gets the dollar amounts, uh, the dates, false maturity, those sort of things are typically tracked in standard databases, but <coughs> that level of information is only available in the PDF. So how do we go about identifying that type of information reliably, accurately, and quickly enough to answer the question when the top management of the company wants to know and want, well, needs to report on the aggregate exposure of the company. So that's where defining an ontology of what that risk is and applying it with Semaphore very quickly, I mean, to do what, 
10,000, 20,000 contracts will only take a few hours, uh, it provides incredible insight into the data. So that's a KPMG story. Um, I'm not going to, to go into much details because I'm sure pretty much all of you have uh, attended Michael Henry's presentation yesterday, but uh, just to reiterate, what we've created with them is a very flexible platform where now, whenever they sign a new client, they can go and model the regulation applicable to that client or the interpretation of the regulations that the client has internally, tune the classification, tune the ontology, and any new content loaded into MarkLogic is automatically you know, tagged and annotated with the right information that will allow the regulatory reporting and will allow the right processes and right policies to apply. The second vertical uh, I wanted to cover was media and publishing. Um, you heard at the keynote um, that Anthony Ucado got the uh, award. Um, actually, it's a it was a very interesting project uh, with Disney uh, doing a metadata hub you know, that covers all the life cycle of the well movie production. So anything from tagging the scripts, defining the characters. Uh, all sorts of you know, pre-production, post-production, metadata uh, management. So everything about reference data, authority lists, uh, managed in Semaphore, loaded in MarkLogic, going through a number of transforms. Um, so that metadata can be applied and reused uh, throughout different stages of the content creation and content distribution. But the use case I wanted to insist on, actually, given the, the message around data silos uh, that we've been hearing throughout the last couple of days, is uh, that of Thomson Reuters. Probably no need to introduce them. Um, everyone knows them. Everyone's probably used them at some point in their life. What characterizes them is the incredible amount of data silos that they have. They produce some. They license some of them. Uh, they link to many data silos that are available out there as well. And what characterizes all those data silos is very precise and very domain-specific vocabulary that they use, uh, especially in that particular project, which was uh, legal and tax uh, and risk management uh, as a first project. So all sorts of different legislation, all sorts of different vocabularies, terminologies, codes used across an incredible amount, I mean hundreds of data silos actually in that particular case. And what Semaphore was used for in that case is map all of those data silos, their vocabularies, and rank the quality and the domain of, um, and, and scope. So not only we could query those together to provide a 360 degree view of a particular tax regime or a particular legal affair, but also based on the user intent, we could actually create a subset of the silos. So for this query, you may want to query those three. For this other query, you may want to query those 10 over there. Uh, because there are so many silos, that querying all of them all the time would simply be inefficient and provide noise uh, in uh, the, the search results. So data quality, as well as vocabulary mapping in that case, was modeled in the ontology. Thanks, Matthew. It's an interesting double act. He talks about linguistic challenges, and you're listening to me in English, and you're not all English. You're listening to Matthew in Franglo English. Not all. Well done. Um, I'm going to take a couple as well. I might skip over the second one, just conscious that uh, we're getting towards the end of the, the time, and we'll leave you loads of time for questions um, and some answers. Uh, so, looking at um, uh, life sciences. Um, Life science is a uh, regulated world. Uh, there is a vast amount of information. When that drug pops out of the end of its, uh, its manufacturing life cycle, it's been a new chemical entity, it's been a project in a lab, it's been in preclinical, it's been in clinical, it's been in, been in manufacturing, it's been in marketing. And in all of those um, bits of its life cycle, it's changed slightly on the way. And the way it's referred to changes on the way. And when you talk about ibuprofen, you're, you're as a customer talking about a headache tablet. But if you talk to the guy that found the new chemical entity in the lab 25 years ago, it, there was no link between what he was playing with at the time and the drug you take to get through the day today. Um, and this is a, a client, it's a, a, a German-American um, drug company, AbbVie. 
Um, these are some um, shots of theirs that uh, they, they uh, allowed us to use. And, it, and this is really around um, discovery r rather than search. Uh, and I saw another uh, drug company um, in, in Switzerland recently uh, demonstrating a, 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 another, or a pilot we'd been working on, where they searched for something, and they got 556,000 responses to their search, which they felt was probably not usable um, because the person looking for the information wasn't going to go trawling through that. But here, we're looking at three different search types and, and what you might get back. And, and, and some of this is sort of linguistic normalization. So someone searching for ABT779, which slips off the tongue clearly, which actually is related to something called A-1006802.0, which you would have known, you know, clearly. Um, and that could exist in any one of five data stores in this particular uh, instance. And what they got back were the results uh, segmented by clinical practice, if you will. So depending on what they were looking for, they would know where to go to find it. Here we have a slightly different search. This person is clearly from the commercial world, searching for a proper word, Lupron. And that says, right, well, that's going to be associated with this mumbo jumbo. And again, searching from different places, coming back with a different set of classifications of results and, and, and a final one there. The key thing here is harmonizing those words. When you start to get really clever, which is what's happening here, you can look at the search term that's being used and you can determine from that search term what the likely requirement to find is. Because a guy who's searching for Lupron is not going to want to be finding you know, things like this because that interest is coming from the post-production side. It's a product name, probably. Someone searching for ABT779 or Luoprolide acetate is probably more scientific. Therefore, the documents likely to be required are more scientific. Uh, and one of the keys in the pharma world is unlocking the stuff they've got locked away in past clinical trials. Pharma companies are always engaging in looking for new products and, and um, undertaking chemical uh, tests and analyses to do that. And what they've got to, locked away is known failures, because when something stops, they keep all that data, they tie a big bow around it, you know, put it in an archive and leave it. And 10 years later, they find what they knew 10 years ago, but they didn't know they knew 10 years ago. So the ability to classify all of that old stuff and start to bring it to bear today is, is very important to them. Um, look at the time. I, I am going to uh, skip over uh, uh, this one quickly. Centara Healthcare, I think the key here is this has been a three-year program. It started very, very small in employee benefits and payroll. You know, hardly a, a critical commercial activity, but it proved the point to the organization, it grew, it grew from a trial to a proof of concept, to a proof of value, and eventually got the money to go uh, corporate wide. So uh, we would love to see things happen overnight. Um, new technologies um, sometimes take a bit of time to reach the executive floor. Um, penultimate slide, I talked about it. Why do we want to work in Mark Logic? Uh, it's a natural fit for us. We produce the triples, we produce the metadata. They've got that huge wrapper around it to store it, to take all of the various um, data sources in from various data silos, to build a nice UI on top of it with query languages. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a pleasure for us. Um, final slide, QA. Uh, for those mathematicians or engineers uh, amongst you, uh, you'll see a Venn diagram there. So you may have loads of questions, and we've got loads of answers, but it's rare that our answer will be to the question you're asking. Um, are there any questions of Matthew? Stunned. Have, have we shocked you all? Thank you, Kevin. Plant. <laughs> We have to. So we are looking for uh, textual 
data of some textual content of some description. So if it's uh, physical PDFs, if it, uh, sorry, if it's um, uh, physical, if it's paper, uh, there's an OCR requirement. Now we we, we work with with companies uh, uh, to to turn that physical paper into a text stream that we can use, um, uh, and we've done that um, quite a lot. Uh, if you have your own favourite, that's fantastic. Uh, if you don't, we'll, we can certainly point you at people we can work with. The, the issue for us there is the higher quality of text stream coming in, the better. You know, if it's a 1927 document uh, and it's all faded and a bit grimy, th the quality is, is not going to be as good as we might be. But that's all down to the quality of the OCR. And uh, it's a good point. Um, I, I, I often talk about us as being... Uh, the fuel injection system in the engine of the car. You know, people don't often buy fuel injection systems. Um, they don't often buy engines, they want a car. And for some of these big applications, we are a very fundamental component of the overall beast. Sometimes people do buy fuel injection systems, and that's marvellous. But more often, there's a bigger component. And so we work with uh, Mark Logic, we work with big SIs, when you look at some of the, uh, some of the bigger requirements. Any more questions or uh, yes? Um, just to respect the fact um, that I'll just post in the comments that program yeah. three or whatever it was. Um, is that sort of assuming then that it's uh, the point of search or a point of interest? Or, so if like your opinion has changed, is there fixed fee in there? Oh, you've got technical things. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was um, is it synonym query expansion or can it be done at indexing time as well? Uh, the answer is both, and it depends on the scenario. Sometimes you want to do that normalization, that harmonization at ingestion time, uh, especially if uh, you want to do operational reporting, because not everything is search. A lot of things can be BI, can be analytics, and there you need to have the metadata ready for the process to pick up. Uh, if you do search, you can indeed do a little bit of query expansion, uh, bearing in mind that query expansion tend to be less precise than initial description, initial annotation of the content. And by the way, completely unrelated, but another way to look at this instead of Venn diagrams is to say it's all about semantics, so you're going to go away with answers for questions you didn't know you had. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much. Oh, no, one more question. That's a very smart logic question. Did you say from OM5? Yes, sir. So can we take that with you offline? Okay. But it's very easy is all I'll say. Okay. And you'll discover that when you talk to Steve who's standing behind you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the, uh, the event. Thank you. Thank you.